All right, guys, let's go ahead and get rolling. It is 12 o'clock ish. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Like I said, just a couple minutes ago, this is your last full in class semester of PT school and you are officially halfway done with PT school. So by show of hands, has it gone fast? Has it not gone fast? Who wants it to go faster? Yeah, I think that's fair. So what I wanted to do to start off the class, I want to start off just a little differently. So what I would like everyone to do is go ahead and stand up here for me. We're going to start the class standing. <clears throat> now, everybody go ahead and lift your left leg. And this way we can start the class on the right foot. I didn't say it was a good joke, but it was appropriate. It was appropriate. All right, so a couple different changes for class this semester. OK, so we're not going to do anything wildly different than we did the first semester. Obviously, this class is going to mimic and mirror what you guys are covering in MSK. There will be a couple times where I go off the MSK trail because we have to cover things like the endocrine system, hematology, things like that. So when you guys are really diving into some of those structures like the hip and the knee, and you have like two or three weeks to do that, I'll cover that structure for about a week in here, and then we'll kind of take an offshoot and we'll cover some hematology and endocrine system and things like that. The other thing is because COVID is not going away anytime soon, I will be recording and posting all of the lectures. So if there's something you miss, don't worry. The recordings will be on Canvas, OK? So basically it takes Microsoft Teams an hour or two to kind of upload and do the recording. And then as soon as it's done, I'll zip it over to Canvas and then I'll post it on the class YouTube channel as well, OK? So that way it's as accessible as possible. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to cover the viscera and the GI system a little bit. This should be just kind of a nice little warm up. This should be in a lot of review, OK? Um, at this stage, you guys probably should have had viscera and GI several times throughout the curriculum. OK, I will not make you draw the blood supply to the celiac trunk again or anything like that. OK, because we all know how fun that was, right? But in terms of medical screening, OK, again, this is really why we're taking this course. My patient comes to me and they have a complaint that doesn't make a lot of sense. And it doesn't make sense to them and it doesn't make sense to me. So in terms of the viscera, what we're obviously looking at is we're looking at internal organs, heart, gallbladder, stomach, pancreas, things like that. A lot of it, a lot of the pain we're going to get from the viscera is going to be associated with the autonomic nervous system. OK, so this is really where having a really good understanding of the autonomic nervous system is really going to help both from a sympathetic side and a parasympathetic side. Because you guys all kind of know that mnemonic that the parasympathetic system helps with rest and digest, right? That's that rest and digest system. Well, you can use that information a lot because if my patient is having abdominal pain two hours after they eat, it's probably not their diaphragm. It's probably something involved with their stomach, right? Because that's the, about the period of time where they're going to start digesting some of that food, meaning that the autonomic nervous system is going to be kicked on especially on the parasympathetic side. And obviously this little thing is not going to work. All right, so referred pain, we can have referred pain all over the place, right? And that's really big concept to kind of differentiate what is radicular pain and what is referred pain. Okay, radicular pain is going to follow the nervous system. Okay, so that's going to be my traditional sciaticas. That's going to be my traditional brachial plexus injuries. That's going to be radicular pain. So it goes from a source, typically in the CNS, zips down the PNS. Referred pain is going to be pain that's starting in a different area that may not cause any pain in the original area that's felt somewhere else. OK, so this is really where we start seeing things like liver issues causing shoulder pain. This is where we see the spleen referring pain to the left shoulder. So again, Think back to last semester and make it simple. Make it very, very basic. If my patient comes to me and they have shoulder pain and their range of motion is fine and their strength is fine, then number one, I would argue, what in the world are you going to work on, right? Number two, it's probably not the rotator cuff, okay? It's probably not their labrum. 
So sometimes the issues are that simple. And believe it or not, you see this stuff in the clinic quite a bit. So just understand what referred pain looks like, like the slide says. It can spread, it can radiate, right? There's times where it starts as a pinpoint and then it starts to spread out in a bigger circle. Typically, if it's coming from the viscera, if it's viscerogenic, what we're going to see is that I could have that stomach pain, that gallbladder pain, that liver pain, but then it feels like my shoulder hurts as well. And if you really think about it, a lot of patients aren't going to connect the two. Or what they're going to do is they're going to take a medication. So if I have stomach pain, oh man, I got some heartburn going on, right? I'm going to take some omeprazole, maybe a little Pepto-Bismol, kind of wash it down, right? That sort of thing. Not necessarily thinking that, hey, you know what? My shoulder's still hurting. I must have a shoulder pain or shoulder problem on top of that, not seeing the connection between the two. Really and truly, that's where you're going to get your paycheck, right? That's where you guys are going to make some money is figuring out and understanding how those two systems are actually linked. So again, a lot of review. Remember the three basic theories of referred visceral pain. Okay, so there is a theory that since we develop as an embryo from two cells from mom and dad out to basically six billion cells, that every cell comes from another cell. Therefore, as we develop as an embryo, we're literally developing from the inside out. Okay, so if you have any questions about that, make sure you go back over a lot of that stuff we covered last semester because that is a pretty prevailing theory is embryologic development. The other big prevailing theory is a multi-segmental innervation. Go back to that big drawing we did in anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system, you know, the one with all the tubes and the lines. That's another great theory because basically what it's saying is you think about it, I have a lot of organs. I have a lot of nerves that all have the same root level, right? So for example, who remembers the root level of serratus anterior? Five, six, seven, C five, six, seven, right? What are the root levels of the ulnar nerve? C eight, T one. Sound about right? Okay. What are the root levels of the cardiothoracic or cardiac splanchnic nerves? T1 to T4. Okay, so my ulnar nerve has a shared innervation pattern as my heart. What do we typically see when my patients have heart pain or having a heart attack? What's a very common symptom? Yeah, exactly. Pain shooting down the left arm. Why? Because the heart and the ulnar nerve share a pathway. OK, so that's exactly what that's saying. And if we really think about it, all of these different viscera, all these different organs are going to have some shared pathway. Not necessarily down an extremity. But let's think back to how things like my external and, inter and internal intercostal muscles are innervated. Do you remember how those guys are innervated? Intercostal nerves that wrap in between each of the ribs. Right. So if I have an intercostal nerve that's wrapping around and innervating my internal, and external, and intercostal muscles, they're also, in a lot of cases, shooting off another branch to something like my liver, something like my pancreas. So what does my patient complain of? Oh, I have this horrible flank pain because that organ's referring pain down each of those nerve roots. OK, so these are the things that you need to think about. So the big takeaway from this is. In a lot of cases, your patient's presentation is not going to be the whole story. OK, the questions I always ask myself, especially with my chronic pain patients or patients that do not have a defined mechanism of injury. Is something had to cause this right? Discs don't prolapse on their own. Labrums don't shred on their own, right? People don't have low back pain out of nothing. So there always has to be some sort of cause. 
Sometimes that cause is a musculoskeletal origin. Sometimes, in rare cases, that is coming from a viscera or another neurogenic case or cause. Okay, so just be careful from that. So these are the common sites of abdominal pain and the common sites of referral. So as you can see, a lot of different stuff happening here, right? I have a lot of spots where the little purple area is pretty close to where the actual organ is. For example, my gallbladder, that's about where the gallbladder is, okay? My colon, that's about where the colon is. Appendix, that's about where the appendix is. Liver, on the other hand, liver is a big one because that's going to refer up to my right shoulder. Why? Because of that multi-segmental innervation pattern. So just understand when my patients are coming in and they're telling me, hey, I have pain here, understand some of the other issues that may happen. You know, a big one that I see actually quite common is patients come in and they have a diagnosis of groin pain. A lot of things down there. Right, that could be anything from I strained my rectus femoris or my gracilis all the way to I have an inguinal hernia, okay, because that's right there, or I have some sort of some sort of problem with my ureter, some sort of problem with an ovary, some sort of problem with the uterus, right? So all those structures are in that area, and because they share that multi-segmental innervation pathway they can refer pain that mimics or masks as MSK pain. So we kind of already went over this. Understand how the ANS works. Understand that, you know, I gave you that example of the cardiac system coming from about C3 to T4. And another good example, and this is an example of direct pressure or shared pathways. This is probably I would say the most concrete theory. If my liver inflames, it's going to push up against my diaphragm. Why? Because the liver lives right underneath the diaphragm or just distal to the diaphragm. Diaphragm is then going to shove my lung superiorly, which is then going to put pressure on structures like my brachial plexus or my suprascapular nerve. That's the other, that, like I said, this is a very concrete theory. Good chart to know, and reason is because when we have these patients that come in and they're saying, I have these symptoms, big one's going to be heart attack. And I will tell you that in the context of this class. Also, when you guys are studying for comprehensive exams, which seem like a million years from now, but you're going to blink and they're going to be here. Screening is a huge part of those oral comprehensive exams. So understanding how the referral patterns work and understanding what signs and symptoms to look for. So for example, if my patient potentially has a myocardial infarction happening, they may have shoulder, neck, upper back, TMJ pain. They could have all of them or they could have some of them. But what else would I expect to see if my patient's having a heart attack? Are their vitals gonna be like 120 over 80? Probably not. Now, if my patient has a rotator cuff tear, do I have a greater likelihood that their vitals are going to be normal? Yeah. Now, not necessarily because we know that people have hypertension and all sorts of stuff, but understand that a lot of this is pattern recognition, right? So if my patient has shoulder pain, arm pain, I don't know how I got hurt. I didn't fall. I didn't do anything out of the ordinary. But how does it, you know, the next question is, how does it feel? What does it feel like? Oh man, it's this shooting, horrible, numb, awful pain. Well, we can probably start to screen for something more neurogenic, something more cardiovascular, right? Because MSK pain is going to present in a different fashion. Soreness, maybe a pinching sensation, maybe an ache, something like that. Then go into your sins. What makes it better? What makes it worse? I'll tell you, that's a million dollar question is what makes it better and what makes it worse? If they said to walk into the clinic 
because your clinic's on the second floor and they had to go up and down stairs, cause their shoulder pain. Unless they walked on their hands, it's probably not the rotator cuff, right? I mean, come on. So recognizing patterns like that can go a long way in literally saving someone's life. So again, that's the end of that chart. So just understand where all this stuff's going to refer to and then understand what other associated signs and symptoms you'll see. This is a good one to know as well. Simply because when that patient comes in and they have an L1, L2 problem, they're not going to complain of L1 or L2. They're going to complain of SI joint pain or where my patients called it. You guys have any patients that literally refer to their SI joint as their hip? Has anyone had this yet? It's like, oh, it's my hip. And it's like, no, it's not your hip. And then you have to go through a 15 minute explanation of why that's not their hip. Yeah, if you haven't, you will. So again, what the patient tells me is really key. When my patient tells me where the pain hurts, where it hurts, that's a big piece of information to know. The big one is what does it feel like, right? If I have shooting pain, if I have numbness tingling, if I'm having motor weakness, okay, that's probably something more neurogenic. If I have this more cyclical pain and kind of this weird ache that doesn't feel right, that's probably going to be more visceral, right? And we kind of talked about that last semester on how sometimes my viscera refers pain. And the example I gave you was on a long car trip, you got to go to the bathroom. It goes through cycles, doesn't it? It's like all of a sudden it's like, holy cow, I got to go to the bathroom. And then you're looking for an exit. And then once you find the exit, it's like, oh, that's not so bad. And then you try to push it to the next exit, at least I tried to. So it goes through a lot of cycles, okay? Visceral pain is very cyclical. So as you guys have probably learned in MSK, that patient interview and kind of living that patient for 24 hours is gonna give you a lot of very key information. If they're having more pain at rest or at sleep, we know that's a huge red flag. Not just a red flag for things like colorectal cancer, but red flag for non-musculoskeletal origin pain, okay? Understand how each of these systems are gonna present. And it was kind of interesting. I'll take a, a second to tell you a little story. Um, so one of our third year students emailed me over break just to kind of show you guys how often this stuff happens. And I got this email and says, hey, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for doing that medical screening class. I just had a patient I diagnosed correctly with cauda equina syndrome. And it got missed. So you guys are going to see it. You guys are going to see it a lot. Um, so understand that this stuff is going to happen. Well, like I said, we already had a student in this program who correctly diagnosed a pancos tumor. So this stuff will happen. Have, has anyone had one of these yet? What'd you have? You got a cauda equina? Okay. Tell us about it. Yeah, so and that's that's a really good example because that individual, how many people have they accessed before they got to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's that's the thing. It probably got to the point where it was so bad it literally just shut off all sensation. Um, but that's the problem with our medical system is that you typically will not be the first person that patient accesses. You'll be like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You know, the system, unfortunately, like the VA, sometimes it's, that number is even greater than that. So very good, very good. All right, so again, visceral pain is going to be gradual, is going to be progressive. Like I said, it's going to be cyclical. It's going to be a lot of times constant. The big thing is unrelieved by change of position or unrelieved by rest. 
again, if we're a physical therapist and we're the movement experts and we're going to move people and moving this person doesn't affect their pain, oh, what are you going to work on? Right? What are you going to do? So the other thing is you're still going to screen them, right? We're still going to do an evaluation on them. But at the same time, if you're if you don't have any sort of findings, then that person probably doesn't belong in your clinic. And it's OK to say, I don't think you belong in this clinic. Because I just recently did. It. I actually re I did it yesterday. I had a patient come in and I was like, you know, there's really not a whole lot that we can work on in here. But I definitely think there's something going on. I just don't think I'm the right person to treat you. So, you know, called up his doc, said, hey, here's what we got going on. And doc was like, OK, I just want to make sure we checked all the boxes. And it was that simple. So don't think if you call a physician that you're going to be wrong or yelled at or anything like that. You a lot of times the physicians counting on you. You know, they really in this day and age, they really view you as part of the healthcare team and they really do value your opinion. So big aggravating relieving factors of visceral pain. Again, if you can't poke it with a stick, if you can't move it around and make it hurt, you know, all this stuff, what are you going to work on again? And then if the patient's describing pain like it's kind of colicky, meaning that like it's just kind of there and it's unstable, if it feels like a knife going through them, feels like it's really deep ache, and you can't reproduce anything, please send them out of your clinic, right? At, le at the very least, they need some other testing. Now, organ-dependent relieving positions. And you're going to take this slide and this information and put it with other findings. OK, so don't necessarily only think that if a patient leans forward, that is definitely gallbladder. Because let's face it, you know, who's had a stenosis patient in their clinic? Right, if you had a lumbar stenosis patient, if you lean forward, they probably feel better, don't they? Right, so that would be other MSK findings that you can't find. There's nothing there. And they lean forward and it relieves your pain. Typically, if it's a kidney problem and it's a unilateral kidney problem, if they lean to the affected side, like you have that patient comes in and they immediately kind of post on their left arm or post on their left side, and you ask them why they're leaning like that, and it's like, oh, this is the only position I can feel better. I'm not saying it's definitely kidney, but maybe ask a couple screening questions about their bladder function and their urination function. So big thing with aggravation. Obviously, if my patient's coming in and they have chest pain and it hurts when they swallow, it's probably not their pec major, right? It's probably their esophagus. GI pain is all going to be eating related or drinking related. And then heart. Cold weather definitely makes heart pain increase. Stress, exertion, like I said, if you're in a second story clinic and your patient's shoulder pain or arm pain gets worse from walking up the stairs, it's probably not a prolapsed disc at C6. Again, screen them, give everyone their due. My suggestion is really take some time and screen like I said, you know, a big takeaway from these courses, take vital signs, you know, make sure you're taking vital signs. That's a give you a really good indication. Later on in the screening process. Look at patterns, right? Look at how a person moves, especially looks. Look at what the aggravating signs and symptoms are, aggravating positions versus relieving positions. Even from an MSK standpoint, that'll tell you a lot. When we're looking at night pain, look at associated signs and symptoms as well. Just because someone's having pain at night, I'll give you an example. Let's say my patient comes in and they have left shoulder pain. All right, well, when's it hurt? Oh man, I can't sleep. That does not mean that they have heart problems or visceral problems or anything. Why? Because they could be laying on that side, right? Maybe their most comfortable position how they sleep as laying on their left shoulder. But they laid on it so much that it's actually caused problems. 
Now, if they start complaining of, and you start asking about other associated signs and symptoms, like shortness of breath, like any sort of feeling that their heart's racing, coughing, wheezing, things like that, then there is a chance that could be a systemic problem. Know how to stage your MSK pain. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you guys are pretty good at it so far. Like I said, you guys take an inordinate amount of MSK stuff. So if you don't know the difference between acute, subacute, and chronic, look it up. But you guys should be pretty good about that. And in terms of bone pain, the big thing we're going to screen for here, if someone comes in and just feels like, oh man, it's just really deep, horrible ache. They may have some sort of neoplasm. They may have, you know, quote, bone cancer. A big one that will actually help, and this is in the lower extremities, is something called a heel strike test. So if literally that person comes in and they have this hip pain, leg pain, femur pain, tibia pain, whatever, what you literally can do, and you guys will learn this later on in MSK, is you literally can smack them in the heel. And if that causes symptoms, because think about it, that shouldn't bother anyone that doesn't have any sort of bone problems, right? But literally what it'll do is it'll send a reverberation up the lower chain and it'll cause pain if there's an issue. So it's a really good little screening test. Yes, sir. Pelvis down. You, I mean, I guess you could do like a palm strike test. Uh, I haven't seen it done very much. Heel strike is a much more common one. That's a good question. So think about red flag symptoms that accompany night pain of systemic origin. And then think in terms of answering this question when posed by a physician. Because here's, here's the situation. Here's the scenario. All right, Ms. McGillicuddy. Okay, you're coming here for low back pain. Yep, sure am. When's it hurt? Oh man, it hurts at night. Okay, are you having any other problems? Yeah, you know, I got some, you know, problems urinating. I got some problems holding my bowels, things like that. Okay, have you uh, had any weight loss or weight gain in the last couple of months? Yeah, I've lost about 30 pounds in the last three months, and now you mention it. So then, what are you going to do? You're going to call the doc. So you get on the phone. Hey, doc, here's what we got going on. And doc says, well, I sent them to you to get fixed. What do you want me to do about it? What do you do? They're blankly at the phone. Go, well, um, I don't know. I haven't been posed with this question before. What you have to do is you have to kind of stand up for yourself. Advocate for your patient. Say, hey, look, based on red flag signs and symptoms, this patient's positive for three or four or whatever the number is out of five, which is a very good indicator that there's something of non-musculoskeletal origin happening here. Then have a plan, right? Okay, so we've identified this problem. What are you going to do about it? Well, this patient probably needs some more imaging. And... You know, what happened to me personally was patient comes in. This lady was about 40 years old and just didn't look healthy, right? She just didn't have a real healthy look to her. And I noticed she came in ambulating with a rolling walker. I'm like, okay, this, that's not right. Right. I get, I get that sort of look, right? Janae just kind of furrowed her brow. So I'm like, okay, this isn't matching here. So get her in. Okay, so uh, you know, tell me what's going on. Oh my gosh, I have this horrible, horrible back pain, and it's just been terrible. Okay, well, how long has it been going on? About three months. Okay, how did you hurt yourself? Did you fall? Did you, you know, how did it start? No, it just kind of got gradually worse. You know, it started out not so bad, and then I'm at the point now where I can't sleep, I can't do anything. I said, well, have you tried laying down and sleeping? Yeah, oh my God, it's so bad at night. 
okay. Well, are you having any problems bound bladder? She goes, I can't. She goes, I, I literally had to stop on my way here because I almost peed myself. And then I start, you know, I said, okay, let's take a look at you. So I did a little MSK screen on her and everything fired her up. I'm talking everything. How to try to do a straight leg raise? Couldn't do a straight leg raise. I kind of palpated her thighs. There was nothing left. Big muscle wasting. So at that point, I was working for a physician on clinics. So I ran down the hall. I was like, hey, doc, uh, we got some, something going on here. I'm not sure what it is. Can we get an MRI? And can we just investigate? I said, I, I don't know what's going on, but she's not in good shape right now. I doubt she can participate in therapy regardless. So doc says, sure thing. Got her in from MRI. Doc calls me the next morning from the golf course and says, uh, you got a second? I said, yeah. He goes, well, she has multiple myeloma and it's stage four and it's not looking so good. So when's she coming back? And I said, well, she's on the schedule for next Tuesday. We need her in Monday morning. And he goes, you and I are going to go talk to her. And that's when we had to give her the news. And it was, that was a tough day. That was a very, very tough day. Um, but and we had to do it. So it was the right thing to do because what we don't want to do is lie to this patient and tell her, oh, yeah, you got to got some stenosis. You're doing OK. Um, but at the same time, she she was almost I hate to say this textbook in the presentation, like almost just about textbook. So when you're evaluating these patients, you know, the way I always look at it is you have to prove to me that you need to be here. Right. Just because somebody comes in with a script or someone comes in direct access does not necessarily mean that they automatically get therapy services. <clears throat> so when my patients. Complaining of night pain. This lady, she hit most of these, right? So she hit awakens out of a sound sleep when she could get to sleep. Pain not re relieved by change of position. She had all sorts of stuff going on. Like I said, she just did not look healthy. The Tums, that one didn't really apply to her. She didn't really have a painful side or a painless side. Like I said, she wasn't a shoulder patient. She was more low back pain. And like I said, she was ambulating with a wheeled walker at that point. So weight bearing was not good. Like, and I had to help her get back to the, their exam room. Myofascial pain is, I will say, a little bit tricky. And the reason it's tricky is because myofascial pain a lot of times gets misdiagnosed as other stuff. Other stuff, fill in the blank, right? So I will tell you that there's a lot of folks out there that have diagnoses of fibromyalgia. You guys may have seen that in the clinic or you might see it in the clinic in the future. Fibromyalgia, unfortunately, tends to be a diagnosis of exclusion. So you guys know what that means? Diagnosis of exclusion means that when we can't figure out what it is, we got to diagnose it, and that's what it is, right? So, hey, we ruled out all these things, and we can't really figure it out, so fibromyalgia tends to be a word they use. There are, when it comes to myofascial pain, there's a lot of different types, right? So I could have a trauma, right? I could get in a car accident, and I have some pain around my muscle. I have some pain around a certain part of my fascia. There could be trigger points. There could be weakness and stiffness or tension or spasms, things like that. But just recognize that sometimes we're going to have pain that's associated more with the fascial system than it is actually the muscles or a little bit of both. When it comes to trigger points, there is, you should be able to palpate a trigger point and it should reproduce their pain. Now, what I will say is a latent trigger point is a trigger point that doesn't hurt until you push on it. 
I, I will tell you that the evidence is a little sketchy when it comes to latent trigger points. Because, and this is the argument I'm going to make against latent trigger points. If I push hard enough on anything, it's going to start hurting, isn't it? Right? So does that mean you have a latent trigger point, or does it mean I'm just pushing really hard? I mean, I'm just pushing really hard. So be careful with latent trigger points only as a sign or symptom of when I push on it hard, it hurts. There needs to be other criteria, okay? So typically what we need is that we need to have some sort of motion problem. We need to have a taut band of tissue. And there also needs to be usually a history of prolonged positioning, prolonged vigorous activity. You know, for example, if you are working overhead, you know, if you're an electrician, for example, there could be some myofascial pain or trigger points simply because of repeated motions for such a long period of time. Trigger points tend to happen in marathon runners or long distance runners in the abdomen. And it's simply because they do so much abdominal breathing and trying to get air in and out, obviously. When you're dealing with trigger points, just understand and just kind of watch out for. Because there are a lot of times that trigger points can get out of control. Or you can have patients that don't necessarily act in proportion. To the injury, right? So, for example. I, you know, slipped a little bit, maybe leaned up against a wall, all of a sudden I'm in 10 out of 10 pain. Doesn't really match. So just watch out for it because there's a lot of times that chronic pain patients, and I'm not saying anything against chronic pain patients, or patients that have this kind of wild expression of pain can have some trigger points, but at the same time, that needs to be in proportion of the injury. There also is an emotional overlay or psychologic components. So the boxes and the tables that the slides are referring to are all in the Goodman textbook. And you know what I will say, and you guys may have already experienced this, or if you haven't, you might. There's a lot that people start to consider when, when they get injured, especially if it's a first injury or if it's a bad injury. I mean, everything from how am I going to get my paycheck? And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I've, had, I've had some really, really tragic cases. Like, for example, my first year of practice, I had a guy who, he was in a pretty bad car accident. It was a truck drive. Actually, no, it wasn't. He was a truck mechanic, and the truck fell on him. And really bad shoulder pain, broke some ribs, all sorts of stuff. Well, he went through the workers' comp process, and every state's a little different when it comes to workers' comp. In the state of Ohio, where I was practicing, when you were on workers' comp, you only got two-thirds of your income, which is a huge hit for most American families, right? Most American families are two paychecks away from being homeless, and this guy got there real fast. So he ended up losing his house. His wife left him. He ended up, like, moving with the sister. Like, it, it got ugly. It got real ugly. So even though he was, from a physiologic standpoint, healing just fine, the other ports, like I ended up referring into a social worker and a counselor because things were getting so bad. So just understand that there's a lot that happens in the 23 hours that the patient's not seeing you. So just be kind, be considerate of that. There are some questionnaires that you can ask for emotional overlay. McGill is a really good one. It's available online. Waddell's. I'll be honest with you, we're not using the Waddell's a ton anymore. And the reason is because there's not real good psychometrics on Waddell's. Another really good one is the SF36. Or you guys have already probably learned about the FABQ. You guys have learned that one, right? FABQ is a pretty solid one, to be honest with you. <clears throat> and like I said, those are available online. 
and and nothing else that'll give you a piece of evidence that there might be something else going on here because you may need to make a referral back to primary care or a referral to psych or whomever. And it's always nice to kind of have that piece of evidence to back you up. McGill specifically is more reliable and valid in younger populations. And the reason being is because they just didn't test it in older populations. So if you have a younger patient that's coming in, and younger is a relative term, right? So my my recommendation would probably be under 50 for McGill. That's considered a younger patient in healthcare. Over 50, you probably need to use something else like the SF36. So when it comes to symptom magnification, this is a tricky one. This is a very, very tricky one. What I will tell you is, regardless of the case, and and I my my personal bias is going to come out here a little bit. There's there is some bias against certain insurances. There are some biases against certain types of people. There are certain biases against all sorts of things. Be very very careful of this because. It is rare that you have somebody that is, quote, completely faking it. It's rare. Usually it starts out as a legit injury. And something happens. So I'll give you an example. One insurance that gets a bad rap is workers comp. And you guys may have heard stories, you know, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, whatever, someone down the street. Oh, I know this person. They've been on workers comp for the last 17 years and blah, 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 blah. And there's nothing wrong with them. And, you know, these stories go around all the time. That is extremely rare. What more often happens is folks legitimately get hurt. And then there's something else that happens. So I'll give you actually a more common situation that I've seen happen is patient gets hurt. Employer does not believe them. That they are hurt. Tries to force them back into something that they are not able to do or force them back into work too early. Employee gets mad, digs their heels in and says, well, I'm not going back and you can't make me. That's a very common. I won't say common, but that is a likely scenario. And I've seen that one happen a lot. So there's a lot of different situations. So when it comes to symptom magnification, be very, very careful. The other thing is understand that we still don't really have a good way of measuring how somebody feels. For example, we use well, we like to use that VAS scale, right? That visual analog scale. What's your pain on skill of zero to 10? Well, my seven might not be your seven, right? My seven might be your three. It's pretty, probably pretty likely that my seven is your three, right? So just understand that, that there, we really don't have a good way to measure pain. There are some symptom magnification definitions. I will say that malingering word I don't like at all because it is rare. It is very, very rare. Are there cases? Yes. Have I seen cases? Yes. Um, usually I don't know that somebody's malingering until it comes out that they are malingering, right? They either get caught by a private investigator or there's some sort of fraud case. I have had instances of fraud cases in my career, but it is rare. Um, I understand that sometimes people are doing it consciously or sometimes they're not doing it consciously. So there are cases where people will just unconsciously, if they had a back injury, we think about it, they've developed this habit where they don't want to forward flex, right? Or they developed this habit where they turn their entire body if they have a neck injury. They don't even know they're doing it, right? They don't even realize they're doing it. So again, with malingering, I think this quote from Olney is fantastic. Just the facts, right? Don't don't put on a bunch of speculation. Don't put on a bunch of overlay. Don't get caught up with what the rest of the clinic thinks or what the front desk thinks or anything like that. 
you know, like I said, I have not learned yet to how to read someone's mind and determine his or her motivation. Because that's exactly what essentially you're doing is you're trying to put on a bunch of mind reading tactics and figure out what's going on. And I've been now I'm in year 20 of my career. I still haven't figured out how to do it yet. So just stick with the facts. I will say that when it comes to potential fraud cases, potential, maybe someone's not on the level. Document, do what you can. If that person comes in and they can't do a single exercise, so be it. Document they can't do a single exercise. Document they're not making any progress. And then they go on their way. But don't put in your notes. I think this person's faking their injury. OK, that's because you have no evidence of that. So just stick to the evidence. And the only reason I bring it up is because I've seen so many therapists try to go down that road and it's not pretty. It's it, it goes bad real fast. So there are some non organic test sequences, right? There's more of the Waddell signs. Like I said, we're not really using Waddell signs a ton anymore, but in case you guys get someone that they've tested positive for X number of Waddell signs, we know that if someone has MSK style pain, they shouldn't have a wide area of tenderness, right? I shouldn't be able to gently load someone's neck and their low back hurts. There are some times that we can use distraction tests. I will say that where I have used distraction tests is, do you guys know what a functional capacity evaluation is? Who doesn't know what a functional capacity evaluation is? Anybody? Okay. Functional capacity evaluation tests, at least the ones I have done, a good portion of the test is figuring out if the person's legitimate case. So. My distraction tests for things like box lifts. I would put a 10 pound weight in the box. Person says they can't lift it. I would then put two five pound weights in the box. And then they turn around and lifted it. Well, OK, this person's not necessarily showing me a consistent effort. But that's as far as I would document is that they're just not showing consistent effort as evidenced by. One 10 pound weight being placed in the box, the patient said they couldn't lift it Two five pound plates. They said they could and that's as far as I go. So just be careful with it. If now with regional disturbances, be careful with this because people can have their entire leg numb, right? If I have something like a stocking or glove sort of distribution because I have a circulation problem, my entire leg might be numb. So that's not necessarily a non organic test, right? Because it says entire leg is numb or painful. Eh, there's a good reason or explanation for that. So like I said, what else signs are not being used much anymore because of this? If there's an overreaction, I would argue define overreaction. So. This could be something like a large yell. This could be something like maybe as you know, someone drops to the ground, some sort of large amplitude reaction. Just be careful with it. All right. Let's go ahead. Let's take 10 minutes, a little DVT prevention. And then we'll get into a little bit of the screening, a little bit of the imaging. And then we'll get out of here for the day. Well, you guys are going to lab. I'll get out of here for the day.
All right, guys, let's go ahead and get rolling and let's get through the rest of this. What do you say? All right, so when it comes to the GI and the Viscera, we have several imaging options. Those imaging options are going to be radiograph. That's going to be a great first line of defense, just like everything else. With the radiographs, we're typically going to see radionucleotides used. Now, those radionucleotides are typically, in layman's terms, going to be like a barium swallow. Okay, you guys may be familiar with that term. Barium is a really, really good element to use because it doesn't really have a ton of side effects. It's easily ingested by the patient or it is injected in through the colon if we need to inject it that direction. And it shows up very, very well on x-ray. So typically where we're going to use something like a barium follow through, right? we do have a couple pictures of this as well, is, hey, let's say that I'm having stomach pain or colon pain, or I'm having some sort of issue with eating. I need to make sure without performing surgery that everything's getting from the mouth down through the esophagus, down through the stomach, a small intestine, large intestine, and then obviously excreted. I need to see that entire route. CT scan, MRI, and ultrasound are also very widely used as well. You guys probably saw in the article that was listed for this week's reading that depending on the organ, which makes a lot of sense, ultrasound can be better or not. So for example, gallbladder is pretty easily seen using diagnostic ultrasound. And in fact, all you really have to do is go in the upper right quadrant, direct the ultrasound beam back towards the liver, and the gallbladder sits just deep to the liver and just distal to the liver. So you can see how the gallbladder looks. MRI and CT scan are good as well. Reason being is because CT scan, I can get a whole bunch of x-rays and I can produce a pretty good picture. MRI is nice because all that viscera is all soft tissue. But again, that first line of defense is typically going to be a radiograph. So when we look at the AP view of the thorax, this is typically what we're going to see. Now, as you guys can see, the lungs are going to show up relatively dark simply because they are full of air. And as we know from last semester, ionizing radiation is going to pass right through air, which means I'm going to have a dark picture. We will also be able to see several other objects. OK, so one thing that a lot of a lot of patients will have done and one image a lot of physicians like to use, especially when they're suspecting that the patient has an enlarged heart. That object. This guy right here. That's the heart. Now, typically what will happen is there's a measurement that's taken from the widest point of the rib cage to the opposite widest point of the rib cage. And then the width of the heart is measured as well. If the heart is greater than one half of the width of the rib cage, or in other words, if I don't have a two to one ratio of rib cage versus heart, then I can suspect that patient potentially has an enlarged heart. So it's a really quick, easy way that I can see even some viscera. All right, so here's a case. We got a 55 year old complaining of chest and abdominal pain. Pain gets worse when the patient coughs. Let's have the objects, any other activity that increases abdominal pressure. Patient locates pain in the center of his chest at the level of the xiphoid process. This is somebody I know. So right off the bat, does this sound like a prolapsed lumbar disc? No. If my patient's having pain when they cough, what system is probably implicated? 
probably pulmonary, right? Now, what are the pieces and parts of my pulmonary system? Lungs, trachea, bronchioles, right? All that great stuff. Is the diaphragm part of the pulmonary system? What do we think? I'm getting some nods. I'm getting some head shakes. I'm getting a, it's Friday afternoon, stop asking us questions. <laughs> so what muscle contracts to allow air into my lungs? My diaphragm. What muscle relaxes to expel air out of my lungs? Diaphragm. So is the diaphragm part of the pulmonary system? Heck yeah, it is. It's the muscular part of the pulmonary system, but that is definitely part of that system. So if I have pain when I'm coughing, and it's right at the level of the xiphoid process, where does that diaphragm attach? Let's go way back to anatomy. Right around that xiphoid process, lower section of the ribs, right all the way back to the lumbar spine. Or if I have pain when I try to sit up or transfer, transfer, excuse me, supine to sit, when I transfer supine to sit, I'm probably going to increase abdominal pressure, aren't I? So if I have xiphoid process level pain when I'm transferring supine to sit, that should be cause for concern as well. So here's what we have. We have what's a hiatal hernia, okay? Now a hiatal hernia is simply going to mean just a big hole in the diaphragm. So to give you a couple key indicators here, a couple landmarks, let's move this guy out of the way so you guys can see. The diaphragm right here doesn't look like that nice big hoop, does it? It looks like it kind of has been deflated. What's the big thing in the middle? What's that? Nope, stomach. That's how large that hiatal hernia was. Because the thing about it, the stomach is pretty darn flexible, isn't it? The stomach's pretty pliable. So when that person was coughing, because they had a big hole in their diaphragm, they increased abdominal pressure, forced the stomach superior through the hole in the diaphragm, and that's what caused the pain. That's pretty gross. This stuff happens all the time. So Again, this person is going to come to your clinic with abdominal sprain strain, right? Don't you love those diagnoses? Yes, sir. Sometimes trauma, sometimes just how the person's made. To be quite honest with you, a lot of times there is a trauma involved, but not always. Sometimes it starts out a very small hole, very small rip. And then the person gets sick, let's say they get COVID, right? And they just start coughing and coughing and coughing. And that little hiatal hernia just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden the stomach just pops through. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the stomach. There are other organs. Large intestine is a big one. You see large intestine pop through a lot. It's simply because they increase intra-abdominal pressure and it that colon is going to go through the path of least resistance. So just be careful of this. I've had a few patients where they'll come in and they'll have something just like this. But again, recognize your patterns, associated signs and symptoms. So CT scan, let me move this thing out of the way. CT scan should be considered when we're looking at something like a AAA or aortic dissection, or a pulmonary embolus. Why? Because x-ray is not necessarily going to be the best modality because I'm only going to get one little view, right? So if I'm doing an AP of the thorax, I'm only going to get one view of the thorax. As we know, one view is no view, essentially. CT is also very effective for evaluating lung nodules when somebody potentially has something problem or some big problem with their lymph system or a lymphedemopathy. CT scan as well, 
and like you'll see this happen a lot with patients because CT scan is an extremely quick way to look at a lot of different levels of the thorax. So I can get a lot of pictures. I can get a lot of views. Yes, I am exposing my patient to a lot of radiation. But let's think about this and think about it practically. If I'm a general surgeon or I'm a gastroenterologist and I need to go in and I need to repair my patient. I can't go rooting around multiple feet of colon or multiple feet of small intestine. All right, I need to know exactly where I need to go right here and right now. So that's where CT is actually a really good modality in terms of imaging. Bowel obstructions can happen. You can see these in the clinic. These are going to be more seen, I'll be quite honest with you, not necessarily outpatient sports med. You can see them. Um, where I have seen more bowel obstruction has been actually home health and acute care, right? Acute care, I always say there's a reason they're in the hospital. Nobody wants to be in the hospital. Patients can go up and go down very, very quickly. Here's how a CT scan of the abdomen is going to look. As you can see, I can see a lot of different things here. Let me move this guy out of the way so you guys can see the whole picture. So I can get a pretty good look. I can get the CT scan done in you know a couple of minutes. And if there's an obstruction, say in the small bowel or an obstruction in the colon, I have a pretty good indication of where exactly I need to focus my surgery efforts on. When we look at an axial CT of the abdomen, the big thing to remember here is that it is viewed toe to head. OK, so that's why we see the liver on the quote, the left side of the picture. You kind of have to imagine that patient laying supine. And you're looking through their lower extremities up towards the head. So CT scans are viewed toe to head. <clears throat> the only reason I mention that is because I know that there's some quiz questions. And I know that obviously there's going to be some exam questions in terms of identification of structures. Just don't get turned around when you see a view like this. Here's how barium looks. And this is actually barium that's injected through the rectum. So typically patients will have what's called a barium follow through a barium enema. And this is really good because it can show you any sort of obstructions. It can show you, it can basically make sure that that barium's going everywhere it's supposed to go. Here's barium of the stomach. So this would be barium that would be swallowed and sent through the esophagus. And there's a lot of cases where they will actually view this under live fluoroscopy. I just kind of have the x-ray machine going and you literally can watch the barium just kind of fill the stomach. This is obviously a very key piece of information because if there's a large tumor in the stomach, you're obviously going to see that barium fill up and then it will kind of gloss over or not surround that tumor. And obviously you can see, well, here's what a stomach's supposed to look like. And this is what this one does not look like. So key piece of information. Like I said, ultrasound is very sensitive. Ultrasound is very specific. Ultrasound is really, really good for gallbladder. Ultrasound is also pretty good for the kidneys. If we think about it, my kidneys are not going to have a ton of bone in the way. And you guys remember from last semester, ultrasound can't go through bone. So as soon as I hit a bone interface, I'm not going to see anything deep to that ultrasound picture or deep to that bone. So ultrasound is very good for gallbladder, kidneys. Um, typically, it can be used for the heart if you use it just right. So when it comes to evaluating cardiac valves, it can be pretty Pretty solid.
a little more on ultrasound. Like I said, it's, a, it's become a modality of choice simply because it's so quick and accessible now. I mean, to be quite honest with you, nobody really used it before because it required a $100,000 machine. Now, as you guys saw last semester, I got a $2,000 machine that hooks into my iPhone. You know, I just saw advertised last semester that they make portable ones that operate via Bluetooth now. I mean, the technology is stupid crazy. So you guys will see it more and more in your clinics as the price keeps to come down. Here's an ultrasound picture, liver and kidney. Now, typically what they're going to do is they're going to put an orientation marker in. Just so they kind of know where they are, because as you can see. To me, that doesn't look like a liver and it doesn't look like a kidney. It looks like a hold on nothing. But typically what we remember from last semester when it comes to ultrasound, I have to know what direction my ultrasound waves are going in. And then I can kind of orient myself. There's an ultrasound of the bladder. Now the bladder is going to be that dark area that you see in the kind of upper third of the picture. The bladder is really nice because the bladder can be a nice window. This is typically why if you've ever had ultrasound done of pelvis or pelvic organs, typically what they're going to have you do is they're going to have you drink as much water as you can possibly handle, and then they tell you to not go to the bathroom. And the reason is because if that bladder is full of fluid, it's a really good medium for sound waves to travel through, right? Sound doesn't travel through air all that well. It travels through water pretty well. So <clears throat> this is exactly why you have ultrasound gel with your patients as well. That's what the uterus looks like under ultrasound in a non-pregnant person. So I can see a little bit of differentiation between the uterine wall and the abdominal muscle. And then that's obviously what one looks like in a pregnant person. So obviously there's several ultrasounds done throughout the pregnancy. Typically one around eight, nine weeks, another one around 20 weeks. That's where the whole gender reveal thing comes in. And then if they need it, one closer to the end. All right, let's go ahead and let's cut it there and I'll see everybody next week. Okay. All right.